Welcome. Thank you. I love your shop. Thank you. I always love this shop. Thank you. I love driving to the shop. I love the rivers that you see yeah. when you drive to the shop. Yep. Um, for those of you who may not know, this is Rob Heal. He is the um, co-owner of Grand River Outfitters and Fly Grand, Shop. Grand River Outfitting. Outfitting. Sorry. Of course. No, that's totally fine. My bad. Um, and Rob is uh, one of the most more fantastic guides in the area. He's got his finger on the button when it comes to all things trouty, bass, uh, multi-species in Southern Ontario, mm -hmm. um, and you and you do hosted trips, you travel all over the place. So good stuff, very good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, we're here today for tight lines and tailing loops to talk about the trout primer. Um, driving here, this is the this is a rough time of the year for me. It's a rough time for everybody. <laughs> it's really rough because we're that we're that close. That close, but so we're not close. quite there yet. Right, there's still some rivers with uh, um, ice on them, and really, trout opener is just over a month away. Right. So, what are your expectations for the season? Well, you know, if 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 I had a crystal ball, I get this. That's probably the question that we get asked more frequently than any other one this time of year is what do you think the season's going to be like? Yep. It's so dependent on, um, on how much snow there is in the woods. Um, and, and what happens, what happens for those first couple of months through mainly through April, May and June, because, um, we, you know, we live in a time where the, the, the weather is, is unpredictable and we can have very droughty springs or we can have springs with, with too much rain. Right. And um, I, I, I like the way it's shaping up right now. Uh, we've got a decent snow cap, which is gonna, uh, it's gonna allow, like for example, our river, the Grand being a tailwater and relying on the Bellwood Lake Reservoir, um, it's gonna allow the lake to, to fill up once the, once the, 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 the spring melt happens. Mm -hmm. um, but the free flowing rivers, uh, like the Saugeen and Maitland and uh, the Credit, all the other uh, major systems that we fish, it should, uh, providing it doesn't all go at once, it should allow for enough groundwater to maintain the season through the prime part of the, the, the year, which takes us into June and, and bass and bass fishing, and then you never know what happens after that. But right, uh, right. but I, I, right now, it's it's shaping up pretty good. I know that there's a, a, a good amount of snow in the woods, and that's what we need. We in Ontario, we did have a ton of snow this year. Um, you know, I was talking to friends in Sault Ste. Marie, um, in Algoma country, and they're telling us that you know they've got eleven. They've had eleven feet of wow. snow. Also, now, really, that snowfall, eight and a half hour drive north of where we are, mm -hmm. will impact our fisheries throughout the summer, won't it? Yeah, I I, I don't know how how far how far north uh, you know geographically it'll affect us because you do have the lakes in between the yeah. georgian bay and, and and huron but um we we certainly have a, a a large enough what would be considered catchment area around here um in the way of the dundalk floodplain and the, the 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 area north of us where most of the rivers flow out of um, that is a massive catchment area of water and um in a normal year with 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 all things going as we hope they go in a perfect world kind of thing that fills up and and will allow those rivers to uh, to maintain their flows what we're hoping for uh with the steelhead for example the early the early the spring steelhead uh, fishing is that we don't get a spate or a or a massive bump of water a week before the season that's the worst case scenario because uh, it'll tend to move a lot of fish out of the system with, mm -hmm. with that big water, they'll, they'll shed and, and then you can end up uh, with the rivers uh, for the most part void of fish. Um, for, the, for the resident trout fishing, you don't mind that so much. The fish are obviously aren't gonna move, but um, we're, we just hope that now we'll, we'll get, we, it looks like we could get a, um, a, a nice little hit of rain over the next week and a half, mm -hmm. which should bring the, the, the rivers up allow new fish, fresh fish to come in and really get the fish that are already in the system, thinking about spawning, get them, get their business done, and then come back into the main stems, feed like crazy and give us a good, a good steelhead season. Yeah. Well, ultimately, <laughs> I mean, I was thinking about you last week when we had that, that huge rain. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a, 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 at my house, I had over an inch. Mm -hmm. 
that was just in my basement alone. <laughs> right. I'm getting that fixed. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I thought about, you know, it, it, it was warming up and that much rain. Would that be the first indicator to start having fish move in? You, you, fish have been, fish will continue to move in throughout the um, throughout the winter, providing uh, there's not too much going on at the river mouths in terms of ice. Um, some of the smaller systems will 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 get to the point. I know, guy, I, I see it all the time. Um, guys catching fish through the ice at Brawny Harbor and and the mouth of the Credit and the eastern tributaries. So the fish are always there. Yep. With those bumps of rain, though, it's it it, it definitely uh, spurs them on and gets them into the system. So right now. Uh, if we if we want to talk about the, the preseason opportunities, right now, the only thing really holding us back is if it's prohibitive. If the if the the shelf ice and the ice along the riverbanks is dangerous, I I don't I when I was when I was younger, I'd certainly take my chances and stand on shelf six ice, feet of yeah. ice, but I, I I don't do that anymore. Right. Um, but uh, my my sense is by this time next week. Providing we get the sort of the prescribed amount of rain, which they're calling for, um, it should be in good shape by the by the third week of of uh, March, and then carry on. Right. So business is picking up for for you now after the winter time. People are starting to get the itch. Yes. Um, they're starting to 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 contact the shop more often. Mm -hmm. They're starting to roll into the shop more often. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the, uh, you know, leading into the season, what are some of the most common questions you get looking forward to trout primer? Um, probably how do I, how do I predict flows? Um, how do I make the best of my, my time off? Um, we do a number of, of talks and seminars each year on uh, included in, in a couple of our courses where we look at the various tools that we have available, um, such as the GRCA website, which which gives you flows for the Grand River. Mm -hmm. um, and that gives you, and that includes the, the, the steelhead water below Paris, and of course the trout water or the tail water. Um, but the Ministry of Natural, the Ministry of Natural Resources, or sorry, Environment Canada has uh, their real-time flow website or, or uh, page that shows you real-time flows for, I'm going to say 75% of the rivers in our region. Okay. So coming into this time of year, w the, the calls that we're getting are, what's fishable? Yeah. And providing you know w where there is open seasons, there's, or the 365 day seasons, um, you can use the Environment Canada website to check the flows and also more importantly than just checking the, the flows right now, but start your own data on, on each river that you fish. So in the future, if you've got something written down in the future, you can go reference back to that and say, okay, well on, on uh, March the 12th, the, the river was, was horribly high and it was at this number on the chart. I need to find out where I can fish it. So by recording the, those figures and data, then you can go back and reference that um, in months or years down the road. Right. It, it's not unlike a musky, musky angler that keeps moon phase logs, temperature logs, Absolutely. Lo G GPS locations on everything. Mm -hmm. It's important to have something like that. Um, we've talked about what the flows, what you think the flows are going to do this year. Um, but now is a time where fishing especially for trout, takes on a different form. You can get out and fish some of those 365 tributaries mm -hmm. um, all season long, but really your fishing should begin in your basement. Your fishing should begin at home. Now's the time to get started That's right. because before you know it, it's going to be it's the fourth here. Saturday in April yeah. and you're going to be scrambling to get ready for the opener. So let's talk a little bit about getting prepared. Well, I think uh, at the end of each season, um, if I know that I'm going to go for a long period without fishing, my, my, my gear generally goes away. So now the process is getting it back out, checking your fly lines, um, making sure that there's, there's no bad cracks in them, um, clean them. Uh, a very simple way to clean your fly line. Of course, you can use the, the um, uh, 
stuff that's available from fly shops like the Rio Wondercloth and, and things like that. But um, you can also do it at home with just a, uh, a paper towel and a little bit of mild dish detergent mm -hmm. in the sink, mm -hmm. warm water, and and just clean them. What I do with mine is I run it, I put it in my sink or I run it through my sink off my reel and make sure you don't have any cats or dogs around because as you lay that on the floor, you don't want it to move. You don't want to step in it. You don't want your cat running through it because it's chewing just going to chewing on it. Yeah. But if even if they run through it, they're going to, it's going to be a colossal mess when you try and put it back on the reel. But generally what I'll do is, is, is rub it down until you don't get any more dirt in the cloth that you're using. Um, and then, run it through a dry cloth to put back on your reel. Most of the modern, the, the premium modern fly lines don't really need to be dressed. The, 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 comp or the, the technology that they're using now allows them to stay fairly slick and shootable, but dirt will definitely inhibit the ability to shoot line through, right. through guides. So most of the fly lines, all they need is, is, a, is a cleaning. Right. Um, you also want to make sure that your reel is clean. Take the spool off it. You don't necessarily have to take it apart. Take the spool off it with a with a cloth. Um, wash it down. Make sure there's no sand and gravel in it. And um, one other thing that I always recommend you doing is take your line out in the backyard or a ball field or something and run a bunch of backing off it. If you if you didn't do a lot of fishing last year and you and you didn't get 50 or 60 feet into your backing with a big fish, you don't know if there's any dug in knots in that. So take it out and run a hundred feet of backing off it and make sure that there's no, that there's no knots on it, uh, in it. Yeah. Back, back to the fly line. Once now that we're out in the field, out in, out in the schoolyard or, or football, football field or what have you, um, this is an opportunity other than cleaning where I like to actually get a buddy and restretch those lines sure. out, right? They've yeah. been sitting on the reel all winter. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you don't want to go out on your first or second day, first day primarily, and have a ton of memory in those fly lines. Right. You know, they're generally set to break between 100 and 130 pounds, so you can really lean on them, stretch them out, yep. um, so that you're, you're good to go on, on, the, on the first That's day. That's right, that's a good opportunity to do that. With the backing, it's important that when you do pull out that 100 feet of backing, bring a glove with you or, a, um, or be prepared to run it underneath your shoe as you're reeling it back on. Problem is, is if you reel it loose, 100 feet is enough backing that if you reel it loose and on your first trip out, you hook into a big fish and it pulls you into your backing, there's a good chance that, that backing is going to dig deep it and could. not up. Yeah. So you need to put it on super tight back onto the reel if mm -hmm. you're going to take 100 feet off, off, right. off your reel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's talk about rods. Um, your rods have been high and dry sitting in their, in their tubes all winter. Mm -hmm. Is there anything special that you need to do with your rods before you, um, you set out for your first trip? I, I won't spend a lot of time, uh, with them. Um, generally, uh, just make sure that there's, you know, that when they were stored, nothing got, if they were stored outside of a tube, um, make sure that they're, uh, they're, they're, they're still in one piece, yeah. <laughs> obviously, and not haven't been crunched by anything. Um, but, uh, there's not a lot involved in cleaning a rod. If you take a, uh, if you take a, a couple of Q-tips and just run them through the, through the guides, make sure that there's no nicks in the guides, um, cause that'll, that can, uh, destroy a fly line. Um, but other than that, you just want to make sure that they're in one piece. Right. And when you ha when you're out in the field, bring your rod with you, assembling it, assemble everything together and, and throw a couple bombs out there. Sure. Right? Yeah. Spend some time, yeah. spend some time casting. If there's, um, that's but if a there's great any point. cracks on the, on the female, um, end of the, of the, the rot, the furl, you want to make sure that you're identified that there's a problem with it right. before you, you set the hook on something and hear that sure. ultimate explosion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, so Jen Donovan from, um, she's moved out to Nova Scotia now, says hi. She's here. Keith Chantel Blair is on as well. Wayne Burdett, thanks everybody for watching. Um, we're here with Rob Heal at... Uh, uh, Grand River Outfitting. Grand River Outfitting <laughs> <laughs> in Fergus, Ontario, talking about the trout primer. Um, we've covered getting ready for, um, going out with lines and reels, uh, as well as with, uh, rods. Let's talk about your overall inventory <clears throat> check, right? Mm -hmm. I love 
the month out before we get going, it's pulling everything out of the closet. Yep. And it's just like Christmas morning for me. Everything's spread out everywhere. You haven't um, seen it in three months. Exactly. What what's what do you keep in mind on your inventory check? Uh, you want to make sure that your uh, if if you've got spools of of tippet um, with a lot left on them, make sure that it's still um, uh, strong enough. And 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 by that way, as a as a as a general rule, I replace my anything from four X down, I replace every year. I won't keep a spool of, of 5X tippet that was left over from last year. Right. Odds are pretty good. A year old tippet are, is going to be good, but as a guide, I don't want to blow a big fish on a, on a spent tippet. Yeah. Um, with, uh, with, with heavier stuff, like your 3X and up, even if you just take a couple yards off, cut it off and you can, and, and you're, you're, you're typically uh, good to go. Um, you want to make sure you have enough of it. Don't get out, don't take the weekend off and, and get to the river and only have 30 inches of 5X tippet on your spool. Yeah. Make sure you've got enough. Um, make sure you've got proper leaders uh, set up and ready to go. Your terminal tackle, if you're, if you're, if you're a steel header, you're gonna need, at that time of year, if you're not, if you're not swinging flies and, and nymphing, you're gonna need ample amount of shot. Um, stock up on your flies before the season get if you if you have a shop nearby you that does custom orders or that will, will do pre-orders for you call them up and say you need six dozen eggs in these colors uh prince nymphs pheasant tails yeah. so on and so forth all the all the stuff that you generally use because opening opening week the shops get the crap kicked out of them slammed with with fly purchases yeah, yeah. um so until we get another order in uh, the, the first couple of weeks of the season, there may be some of the, even if, even if we order six dozen of one pattern, I, we've got guys that will come in here at real ardent steelhead fishermen who don't necessarily tie that will get a dozen flies of, of each pattern that they use. Yeah. And it doesn't take long to, to, to dwindle that inventory. So um, get with your shop and, and and make sure that they can fill an order for you um, before the season, and, and that way you've got it in your hands. Not only for, for completed flies, but if you tie your own flies, you know, as soon as everybody gets the fever for the flavor, mm. they're on their way, mm -hmm. right? So I know I know a lot of guys will tie, tie their own flies all through the wintertime, that's kind of the pastime, but you know, as soon as you start getting the, feeling the love for what, what you want to do, yeah. you know, these shells dwindle really fast, no That's matter right. how proactive you are as a shop owner. Right, right. Um, all right, so let's talk about hatches now that we're on to flies a little bit. Um, what opening week in Southern Ontario uh, to Central Ontario, what are you looking at picking up to make sure that you're well equipped for, uh, for most trout species? Okay, um, I, treat the, um, I treat the steelhead fishing and the resident trout fishing a little differently. Okay. For steelhead, uh, I will. I, I, I want to make sure that I have a good assortment of of larger streamer type flies, mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily the same stuff that we're using in the fall. Um, although it will work. The, the one thing to keep in mind with the steelhead, post spawn steelhead are, are, are actively eating. They're when they come off those reds and are back in the main stem of the river where we're going to be fishing, um, they are feeding voraciously. I've had I've had uh, Celted steelhead regurgitate crayfish in yeah. the net when we've landed them. So you want to have some sculpin, some some big meaty sculpin patterns like a lot of this the stuff that that our guys like uh, Nick Groves and Jay King tie that you see on on Facebook all the time. Those big big in your face flies um they will they, they will prevail with with spring steelhead you also want to have um if you're if you're not a swinger and uh, you, you want to make sure that you have, you've got a, a good assortment of eggs um, and nymphs and at that time of year the bugs are starting to get far more active the first major hatch that we're going to expect to see uh in the in the in the spring are the hendricksons on most of the rivers around here and it doesn't matter whether you're you're fishing for resident trout or uh, steelhead um, those small sort of uh 14 size nymphs in tandem with an egg or another nymph for that matter will work wonders um, by the time the water temperatures hit 
50 degrees, there's a lot of bug activity. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to treat the steelhead fishing uh, more like trout fishing at that time. Have an assortment of small stuff because you're going to have blue winged olives in the rivers up to uh, you know around that size 18. And I know it sounds I know it sounds silly um, going after those big fish with small light wire hooks like that, but there are periods if you get a period a long period where it's um, the water is low and clear. Those small flies on, on and, and I know I made a joke last week when you were talking to Bill about uh, steelhead fishing with 4X. Yeah. I have a hard time going any lower than 4X for steelhead, um, but there are periods, uh, if we get them, where, where, where the rivers are low and clear, um, where nothing will work better than those small flies, because again, the, the, the steelhead are much more trouty. Yeah. So in our region with the, the Saugeen, the Upper Saugeen, uh, the Upper Credit, the Grand, and all of your your, your little favorite um, uh, brook trout haunts or wherever you're fishing, whether it's the, the Upper Humber, you name it, the Hendrickson is going to be the first major hatch of the year. So pheasant tails in 14s and 16s, you, you want to have those. Um, all your usual suspects, your caddis, various caddis larvae, um, not a lot of caddis activity that that time of year, but because of, of high water periods and, and flushes and spates, there's a lot of food in the drift. And as the water temperatures continue to rise, the fish are going to continue to get more and more active and starting to key in on the aquatic insects rather than chasing bait fish. But that's not to say opening week, you don't want to have an assortment of, of big streamers in your in your gear too, because these fish are hungry. Okay. They're coming off a long period of, of inactivity. Okay, so that leads me to this this question, and uh, I will be forthright in telling you that, and you know this because we've only ever fished once together, that I, I'm very inexperienced in my home region for, for stream fishing, for, for trout. Mm -hmm. Steelhead, no problem, but right. trout, I'm very inexperienced because shooting the new fly fisher, we're always gone. Sure. Right. So I don't have that. I don't have those opportunities. We're all up gallivanting mm -hmm. all around. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've realized in in guiding in the far north, uh, up in the Albany River system, is and that's where we generally are. You know, mid to end of May. Mm -hmm. um, personally, anyway, not necessarily for the, for the show, but. I've learned that those big brook trout, like the big ones, the ones that are like six, seven, eight pounds, yep. they're not looking for nymphs no. at all. They're, lo no. they're looking for terrestrials. Yep. I've only ever had to swing flies for those fish once, mm -hmm. and that was my first experience there. First fish was a six pound brook trout. Mm -hmm. um, does the same bode well down here to even have some terrestrials in your box, whether they be mice, or ants or beetles or any anything like I know it's too early for hoppers, but are you gonna get those predatory instinctual terrestrial takes? You I, I think until the until the rivers really hit that that 53, 55 degree mark, um, there's not a lot of looking up. It's not to say that you, I, I remember one time years ago, um, we were fishing on opening day on, on, on the Grand, and it's the first time it's ever happened, uh, and we must have had a, uh, a, a mild winter, but we had a substantial Hendrickson hatch at about three o'clock on, on opening day, and, and we switched over to dry flies and caught fish. It's the only time in 22 years of fishing this river that that's happened. Right. Um, now the Grand is a little different because it will stay six, eight degrees colder than most of the rivers around it because of the, the big reservoir. But um, opening week and, and going into about the first week of May, I think you're better off fishing subsurface. And as you said, with, with, with big meaty in your face streamers, if you're, if you're hunting big fish, the guys that consistently catch big fish on, on opening week um, will often be using large streamers. So as I said earlier, have some of those in your box, but it, unless, unless something was to really happen that you saw a big spike in the water temperature, I don't typically start uh, really focusing on, on the surface fishing until I start seeing bugs okay. and, and rising fish yeah. for that matter. Right, right. Um, all right, so we're ready to go for uh, for opening opening week. Um, let's talk about rod weights. Let's talk about gear that you should have on you when you uh, when you hit these tributaries of these Great Lakes. Um, rod weights, 
vary from system to system. Um, one of our guides, Mike Metcalf, and I have been discussing this for the past couple of months. We, the grand, just as an example, uh, we are we're often using three and four weights, and and while they'll prevail most of the time, um, this year I'm going to jump. I'm going to take my 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 rod weights up to five and six weights, only because we're typically targeting big fish and uh, we want to be able to get them in quickly. They're, they're certainly nicer to cast than three and four weights. Um, but you're, the system that you're fishing has to, and the fish that you're fishing uh, should dictate that. If you're fishing the upper tributaries of some of the smaller creeks and catching nothing but you know, a big fish would be a 12 inch brook trout, then three and four weights are perfect. Um, and gear your, your length to what you're seeing around you in terms of the canopy around the river. If you're fishing a nine and a half foot rod and you've got a lot of overhanging branches, it's not gonna work as well as a seven and a half or an eight foot rod. So yeah. take a look at those things. And if, if you're trying to find a rod that's a one rod that's sort of dedicated to most of your needs, um, then those are some some things to consider. And, and of course a reel and the size to match it. Um, and, and the line to match it as well. There's so many different fly lines on the market now that it, it is, it's daunting to find it really one is. line to do everything. I mean, we're fortunate, um, you, you being host of a television show and me being a, uh, a fly shop owner, we have uh, access to a lot of different lines. But if you're just looking for one line, don't, don't just buy a, a fly line online. Get with a professional, get with a guide in your area, or go to the shop and talk to them, discuss your needs, and they'll set, steer you in the right direction in terms of what fly line you need. Right, so for me, and I'll ask you the same question, if you were stranded on the desert island with mm -hmm. one fly line for trout, trout opener, you know, I would, what I, what I like to do is, is uh, impart a spool system, mm -hmm. right? So I'll keep my main fly rod with a, with a weight forward floating line matched to the weight of the rod. Right. And then I'll, I will keep a sink tip or a poly leader mm -hmm. that I attach to the line if I want to swing something a little deeper. Mm -hmm. Conversely, in my pocket, I'll keep a separate spool with an inter intermediate sinking line. Okay. So that I can quickly switch out. Sure. And I you're need, covering all the, covering the all entire the water pump. Yeah. But it has to be matched to the, to the rod weight. Right. Definitely. Right. So, what about you? Same thing? Um, yeah, if I was if I was on a desert island with probably with only one line, um, it would it would probably be a Rio Gold. Um, uh, if you if you had the option of an assortment of of tips, all of the the major fly line manufacturers now are are installing welded loops in their lines, so it's very easy to change out um, from a floating leader to to various densities of sinking leaders. Um, the, the Rio Gold is, is, a, is a fairly generic weight forward line, but it's going to allow me to manage reasonably big uh, streamers mm -hmm. on, on heavy leader and allow me to deliver small dry flies on, on a long on a fine leader, leader yeah. reasonably well. Right. It, it, like anything, um, I, always, I always make the, the rod or line comparison to, to a golf bag. You, you, you may not need every club in your bag every time you go out, yeah. um, but no one line will do everything perfectly, but it doesn't mean you need 10 different lines either. No, yeah. exactly right. Um, so we've been talking about what the primer is, what, how to get ready for trout for this, this coming season. Um, but what's fantastic about where we live in Southern Ontario is that there's fish opportunities all season long mm -hmm. for multi-species in certain regions. Um, let's talk about pre-fishing mm -hmm. um, and what, what you like to do. Well, right now we're, we're starting to get to that point where we're going to be looking over the next, over the next few days um, at getting out and just doing some, some, some scouting. Uh, we'll, we'll, of course, we'll take our rods with us, but we're, I'm going to travel. I'm going to have to take a day and dedicate to uh, the Saugeen, which is where I do the majority of my, my steelhead fishing. Let's clear something up before you go on. The reason why Rob and, and his group are able to bring a fly rod with them when they're scouting is because where they're fishing is open 365 That's right. per season. That's right. If you were to go to a tributary above the highway, mm -hmm. you can bring your waders and everything with you, but 
don't don't even have your rods in your vehicle. Right. Not at all. Right. Sorry. Um, no, that's that's a good now. that's a good point because uh, it, it, the the rules the 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 open seasons that are in place right now um, when you look at it at them in the summary of regulations it is a little bit convoluted. Yep. Um, one of the one of the again the more frequent phone calls that we get here at the shop is what's open. And I don't mind. I don't mind regurgitating what's in the what's in the, uh, the the summary of regulations and trying to 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 bring it into focus a little more. But it can be confusing. So know where you can fish. But what I'm going to be looking for now is how much snow is and, and ice uh, in particular around the river banks. Um, if I go to say spend some time on the lower Saugeen, which is open uh, uh, all year, if if I've got 10 or 12 feet of shore ice, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to fish. It's just, it's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. But what I will look at is what, what the river's doing uh, in terms of rising or dropping, how much rain we have coming and how much rain I think is going to, is going to move, how much the rain is going to move the river and hopefully blow that ice out so that when the river does recede to a number that we like, we know that we can go back if we haven't had a foot of snowfall. And, and extremely cold temperatures, we know that we can go back in a week's time and probably get through the woods to the river and to the bank and, and fish in a meaningful way. Right. So I like to get out and, and scout, even, even the upper uh, areas. Mike and I were just talking about getting up into the uh, next week, going up into the, into the upper big head and just looking for spawning fish, mm -hmm. just seeing what they're doing. Yeah. If, if you get up there and the, and, and the water temperatures are, are, are good, and there's a lot of redding fish, then we may, we may say it, it on the 12th of, of March, we may say, well, if these fish get their business done, uh, there might not be a lot of fish around on that river on opening day. Mm -hmm. But if we're not seeing any redding fish, then we know that it's, it hasn't happened yet, or there's a good chance it hasn't happened yet, and the big head might be an option for opening week if you're going to take a couple or three days off and yeah. fish. Yeah. Um, so get out and do some scouting. Um, I always encourage guys to to scout when the rivers are low. And whether that's in August or in March after cold conditions and you know the river is low, get out and take a look at the river when it's when it's at its lowest and take a walk and go to the areas that you fish in the spring and fall and get a feel for how the river looks and its nuances where where holes are, where rocks are, um, just the, the little characteristics of, of, of your beats, it really pays dividends to go and, and take a look at them when they're at their lowest mm -hmm. and make some, some shore line references in terms of the pools and, and, and rocks and get a visual image of it. Yeah, well, that's the key, right? As you can see it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You can see it. Okay, so is there anything else you want to talk about, about uh, opening, opening for trout here in Ontario? Um, I think we've, we've covered a lot, a lot. Yeah. Um, certainly if you have any questions, um, you, you can go to our website, <clears throat> pardon me, <coughs> you can go to our website and, um, send us an email through our general inquiry or send it direct at info at grof.ca. Um, and we're, we're pretty forthright with, the with the information we provide. You're fantastic, you're fantastic. <coughs> Excuse me. I think one of the things that I would walk away from in, in talking with you today, Rob, is number one, don't wait till the last minute to, to get your stuff ready. For be, sure. Be prepared, uh, go through mm -hmm. all, your, all your gear, including your waders, you know, sit in your bathtub, you know, with your waders on, yep. make sure you don't have any pinholes that you mm -hmm. didn't notice from last year. Um, if you order flies, order them early, um, because everybody and their brother and their aunt is going to order that week coming up to yeah, to or get, get them in now. Look at your inventory now, and and yeah. and give your local fly shop a call um, within the next few days. Yeah, remember to always before you go out on <clears throat> that uh, that first day back on the river. Um, remember to tighten down your drags again. Don't forget your drag. Mm -hmm. Loosen your drags off in the winter time. Don't forget. And for heaven's sake, look at your outdoors card and make sure that it didn't expire that's a, as of December 31st, That's a valid point. There was a whole pile of them that did expire um, uh, January 1st of 19. So, yeah, so yeah that's, that's, a good, uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I, that I, I do want to mention, 
Um, if you're fishing in this area and you're looking for conditions, we do, um, we'll, we'll be starting a, a daily update on river conditions. But if you're unsure of, of where you're going, uh, by all means, give us a call, especially this time of year. There's no sense on, on, on getting, driving two hours or three hours and getting somewhere and not being able to fish. So if I have information, we'll, we'll certainly give it to you and, and think about safety um, above and beyond everything else. Don't, don't go overboard for, yeah, uh, for, for, a, fish. for a fish. Yeah. So that's an interesting point that Rod does do these, these regular flow river conditions updates, and you can find that on his, on his Facebook page. Uh, and on the website. And on the website as yeah. well. So Ontarioflyfishing.ca. Right. So a um, couple of administrative things. Don't forget to um, let us know what your primer rituals are in the comments below uh, on Facebook. And come Sunday when this is uploaded to YouTube as well, um, please let us know because we're all, everybody's learning from everybody else in this business. And, and That's right. even though you're a fly shop owner and I host a television show, doesn't make a difference. Nope. Always learning. Everybody's got something, a cool, better trip tip or trick. Um, don't forget to enter the Algoma Best Catch Contest. You can do that on the new Fly Fisher website, excuse me, the new Fly Fisher Facebook page, as well as the um, uh, Algoma Country website. Uh, you have a fantastic opportunity to win Yeti gear, a GoPro 7 as a grand prize. Uh, check out Rob's um, shop if you're ever in the Fergus area. Next week, we're going to be back right here talking to brown trout legend Mikey Metcalf. We're going to break it down. We're going to do a small stream um, analysis of how he likes to fish for browns in the area. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay. So for everybody here at Grand River Outfitters. Outfitting. Outfitting. outfitting <laughs> fly and fly shop. Get it right at one of these sure, days, man. Sure. I want to thank you, Rob, for everything. And My pleasure, Mark. Thank we'll you. see you on the river. Yeah, for sure. Take care. Thanks. Everybody.